Would you turn in your Bibles to uh, the book of Romans, chapter 12? And the title of my message this morning is, What Did Jesus Actually Lay Down in the Manger? The rest of this month, we're going to be talking all about his life on this earth, his crucifixion, his resurrection. We're going to do that for the rest of this month. Just lift up the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So the Bible speaks often of sacrifice. Sacrifice means laying something down that's important to us. The word sacrifice brings in the concept of being humble, humbling ourselves before the Lord. God's word tells us that we as believers are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. So Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Then the Bible goes on to say, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And then the Bible says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but think soberly according to the measure of faith which God has given you. As we look into what's going on in the world, there's so many things that are absolutely captivating people's minds. A lot of people are led astray by lies. Uh, do you know that sometimes Christians lie? <laughs> yeah, they do. They try to tear up the church and... Uh, we're here to tell you that we're not going to allow that to happen. We are going to stand with the word of the Lord, keep the unity of the faith, and keep preaching the word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, in talking about sacrifice, sacrificing our own selves, and humbling ourselves before the Lord, have you ever considered what Jesus had to lay down? Do you ever consider the price that he had to pay? what he had to lay down or sacrifice. So let's take a look at the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. And I just want to read what the Apostle Paul had to say to the church of Philippi about what Jesus went through in order to lay down in the manger. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. First of all, Paul writes, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. God will not allow people to lift themselves up above the Lord. I recently had a person say, well, my people, I'll do what I want with my people. And I said, well, you know what? If you don't have nail holes in your hands, they're not your people. Those people belong to Jesus Christ. They don't belong to you. They don't belong to any pastor. They don't belong to any teacher. They don't belong to any group. They belong to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So the first thing God says is don't do anything through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each one esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. So we've always been open here in this church of anyone who wants to volunteer, that they are more than welcome to volunteer to do whatever they want to do. In fact, I'll give you an example. Uh, Joanne is sitting there, and she asked me recently, do we only have uh, a church banquet on 4th of July, or are there other times? And I said, oh, anytime anyone wants to have a, a banquet or a get-together back in our uh, our fellowship hall, you are more than welcome to get it organized. The thing that grieves me is when people want to volunteer and others tell them, no, I don't need your help. Brethren, we need your help. We need your help. We want your help. We want you to stand up. We want you to volunteer. We don't want this to be a, a, everything about one person. We want this to be about the entire church. Amen? So he says, look not only on the things of your own interest, but also on the interests of others. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now think about Jesus. 
Was he thinking about himself or us? He was thinking about us. Who, being in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. And he took the form of a bondservant and came in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself again. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So in Philippians 2, 6 through 8, what the Bible is telling us here is that Jesus left heaven. He left his place with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. He humbled himself to the point where, where he became like one of us. Luke chapter 2 tells us that Mary wrapped Jesus in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Seeing Jesus in the manger speaks to us of the meekness and obedience of Christ to reveal God's love for us. Jesus laid down his scepter. He laid down his royal robe. He laid down his crown and his place with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He laid all of that down. And he came to the sin-cursed earth for sinners like you and me. Had a brother tell me one time, I'm not a sinner. I said, well, God says you are. Let God be true and every man a liar. No, I'm saved. I'm a saint now. And I said, yes, you are a saint, but you're a saint because of the blood of Jesus. And you still have a sinful nature. So just in case anyone was wondering, can we reach sinless perfection? Here's what 1 John chapter 1 tells us in verses 8, 9, and 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Jesus came to a sin-cursed world for you and I. That's why he came. He became an infant, like all other babies that are born into this world, is there anything weaker than an infant? A baby can't walk. A baby can't talk. A baby can't express in words what he needs or what he wants. A baby cannot provide a single need for his life. He is totally dependent on his mother. Jesus came this way through birth to identify fully with us. He was like us in all ways, and he faced every kind of temptation, yet, the Bible says, yet without sin. So in the manger, we see baby Jesus lay. Now in Hebrew, Jesus' name is translated as Yeshua, and Yeshua means the Lord saves. That's what Yeshua means. So when we pray in the name of Jesus or in the name of Yeshua, what we're really saying is the Lord saves. And I like that. Uh, let me add the Lord, only the Lord saves. Amen? So looking closer in the manger, we can really see the love of God. Seeing Jesus born in a manger, we see how much he lowered himself to redeem us. And it amazes me sometimes how we as believers refuse to lower ourselves. We refuse to humble ourselves sometimes. We think we're always right and everybody else is wrong. And the fact of it is we need to humble ourselves before the Lord and he will lift us up. Jesus deserved to be born in a mansion. That's a fact. He deserved to be born in a palace. But instead he was born in a cave, in a manger in the lowest place where a person could be born. So let's go back over Philippians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 3 through 7 again. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for the things of your own interests, 
but also for the interests of others. You know the definition of joy, J-O-Y? Jesus over you and Jesus others and then you. When we put others first, we have the mind of Christ. That's what we do. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a bondservant and came in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Have you ever wondered why when the Roman soldier stuck Jesus in his side, out came blood and water? Well, there's a medical term for that. It's called pericardium. And with pericardium, what happens is when your heart beats so fast, it literally breaks. It breaks and it separates the plasma from your blood and the water in your blood. And that's why when the soldier stabbed him, I believe Jesus died of a broken heart. His heart beat so fast for humanity, taking on the sin of humanity. When he was stabbed in the side with that spear, out came blood and water, a broken heart. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Because God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. That's, that's God's love. So let's take a look at a few scriptures here in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 7. God let humanity know that he was coming. And he let humanity know that he was coming in a certain fashion. In Isaiah 7 and 14, the Bible says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Now, we know that Jesus said, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after signs. Therefore there will be no sign given to it other than the sign of Jonah, who spent three days and three nights in the belly of a whale. Okay, so God says if you want a sign... This is going to be your sign. I'm going to be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights, and then I'm going to rise again. That's our sign. And that's not only a biblical sign, that's a historical sign. It is written in history through Josephus and other Jewish uh, historians that it was a fact that Jesus was killed on the cross and that he was buried. And that after three days, he rose from the dead and spent over 40 days with his disciples doing many other miracles. In fact, if you look at the very last verse in the book of John, I think it's John 21, 28, the Bible says, if all the things that were done by Jesus were written down, there would not even be enough room in the world to, to have all the books. So Jesus did a lot of things that we don't even know about that God hasn't even written for us, but he's written for us what we need to know so that we can put our faith in him. So the sign that God said, therefore the Lord will give you a sign, behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son and you will call his name Emmanuel. First time in world history and it's never happened again that a virgin conceived and bore a son. And it's the only time it'll ever happen in human history, one time, where the Holy Ghost came upon Mary and she conceived the seed of the Holy Ghost and Jesus came to this earth. Isaiah chapter 9 goes on to give further signs of what's going to happen when this baby is born. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says, Unto us a child is born unto us that's us that's you and me unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder there's proof that God is in control of everything that's going on in this world the government is upon his shoulder Jesus Christ makes the decisions on what happens and we, we for instance we, we take a look at 2020 
when COVID was spread across the world. And my, my often, I often wondered, why did God allow that? Why didn't God just step in and stop those people in that lab in Wuhan, China from doing that? Why didn't God step in? Because I believe God wanted our eyes to be open to the wickedness that goes on in governments and in the world. I believe with all my heart it was a wake-up call. It was a, it's not as it seems call. It was to expose and show the wickedness that happens in this world. It's been going on ever since. Now it's almost uh, election time here in a few months. In 2024, I think there's more evil on the way. I believe God is in control, and I believe God could turn it around. But if this is a wake-up call for people to come to Jesus, then I just say, praise God, bring it on. We want to see people saved. People want to be in comfort. I want to see people saved. Amen? So he says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful. Counselor. That's the name of the Holy Spirit, by the way. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. Whose name is that? And the Prince of Peace. That God is all in all. What God was saying there in Isaiah chapter 9, I am coming to the earth in bodily form as Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Son of God. I am coming as God. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 says, God demonstrated his love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we'll be saved from wrath through him. That's Romans 5, verses 8 and 9. God literally says, while we were yet cursing him, while we were yet against him, while we had not received him as Lord and Savior, he died for us. I look at it in a more personal way. When Jesus was on a cross, and I'll just, I'll just talk about Joey here. When Jesus was, I don't want to talk about your dad too much because he always gets me back. So <laughs> let's just talk about Joey. Jesus dying on the cross, looked at Joey, saw when he would be born, saw when he would grow up, saw the day he would accept Christ as his Savior, saw everything he would do until the day he was taken up into heaven. And Jesus said, in spite of all of what I see in him, in me, in all of us, I'll die for him. If, if you were the only one on earth, Jesus would have died for you, Joey. He would have. So, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. That's love. Amen. That's love. Galatians chapter 4, in the, in the book of uh, Galatians, so we were in Philippians. If you turn to your left, you'll be in Galatians. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 says, Now when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son. So that teaches me that there's a timing to everything in God's kingdom. There's a timing. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God will make everything beautiful in his time. But he has put it in our heart not to know the things that he's doing from the beginning even to the end. So we would never understand all the things that God is doing. One of the things that came up this week as I was uh, uh, having a discussion what about the book of Job? When God said, have you considered my servant Job? And it makes one wonder, wait a minute. Why would God say, have you considered my servant Job? To the devil. Why would he do that? Well, the Bible says his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways above our ways and his thoughts above our thoughts. Have you ever thought about your life in, in the way of, I wonder why the Lord allowed that to come to me? I wonder why the Lord allowed that to happen. Because his ways are higher than our ways. 
And once we look backwards and look and see what our life looks like, now we can understand what God was doing. Can I give you an example of my own personal life? When I was a young boy, my grandpa uh, owned a sheep ranch. And it was a big sheep ranch. They had a lot of sheep. And so as a young boy, if I wanted to make money, I had to go out to the ranch and work on the sheep ranch. And, and that involved carrying hay, baling hay, bringing water, digging ditches, all kinds of stuff. And I never understood all of the things that I was learning until after I got saved. I look backwards. For instance, there was a man named John Mafiodakis. He was from the island of Crete near Greece. Uh, Cretans speak about three times faster than normal language. The Greeks speak uh, about like I'm speaking now. But Cretans speak really fast like a machine gun. So we would catch about every five words that John Mafiodakis said. But he was the Greek sheep herder. And it amazed me that he was always mumbling to himself. He was just mumbling all the time. So we used to call him Crazy John. I mean, as kids, we would look at him and go, that guy's nuts. He mumbles to himself all the time. He stays up with the sheep all by himself up on the plateau all year long. He doesn't even come to town. They bring stuff to him. He's a loner. Until I got saved, and until I read the verse, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. You know, the sheep would never follow me. They didn't know my voice. All they did was scatter when I tried to get them together. But when John would walk into the sheep pen and mumble to himself, all the sheep would gather around him and go wherever he went. And so there were so many things that I learned on the sheep branch that I wondered, why am I doing this now? And I look back on my life and I see that's what, that's what Uncle Johnny meant when he said, your job is to bring the hay and the water. These are not your sheep. You can't shear them. You can't sell them. You can't beat them. You only can feed them. Bring the hay and bring the water. You know, did you know that you can't even chase sheep because they can run faster than you? And if you try to chase them, they'll run further. So they'll only listen to the shepherd. They'll only listen to the shepherd. That's why when some people run off because of pride or arrogance or whatever it is, I don't chase them. Do you know why I don't chase them? They're his sheep. If they're not going to listen to his voice, why would they listen to my voice? Amen? If they're not going to listen to the Holy Spirit, why would they listen to me? Or why would they listen to you? So I learned so many things on the sheep branch. You can look back over your life. Look back and see and understand why God put you in certain places at certain times and allowed certain things to happen in your life. Because it was for your growth and for your maturity. Because he's calling you home someday. And he's calling perfect lambs to come home to him. Mature mature lambs to come home to him. So in Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, the scripture says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, and born under the law. Now, Jesus could have been born in 1950. He could have been born in the 600s. But God wanted him born during the time the Israelites were under the law. Because those were God's chosen people. And God wanted to send a messenger directly to his people to say, here I am. I am the one. And so the Bible says, he came to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you were sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but you were a son. And if a son, then you were an heir of God through Christ. That includes daughters as well. A lot of people say, well, why is it always he, 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 son, son, son? How come it's never she? Well, it is she in a lot of places in Scripture, but when God speaks of son, he's speaking of the Greek word anthropos, which means people, okay? So, or children. We are children of God. But he calls it son, but if you look up the Greek word, it's anthropos, and it means people, male or female. You know, remember what Jesus said in the Bible? There's no male or female in Christ. We are all one in Christ. 
Yeah, we have different offices. We have different things that we accomplish. But God sees our soul more than he does our sex. Amen? Amen. He sees our soul. So the Bible says in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. Interestingly enough, in John chapter 1, the Bible says he's, he came into his own. But his own would not receive him. But to as many as would receive him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe in his name. And that word believe means to totally, completely trust upon. So Jesus is saying, if you totally, completely trust on me, you have a place in heaven. You know who got the place in heaven just before he left? The thief on the cross. Think about that. He said a word that saved him. A lot of people think, well, because he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That No, not at all. Those words didn't mean anything. What meant something to Jesus is that thief recognized he was the Lord. The first word out of his mouth was, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And because he recognized that Jesus was the Lord, Jesus said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Not later, not down the road, but today you'll be with me in paradise. That backs up what the Apostle Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says there's a time and a season for every purpose under heaven. There is a time and a season. So if you just think about the seasons we live in, and not necessarily in California unless you live in Northern California, but you have, starting out after January, the winter, then you have spring, then you have summer, then you have fall. And we have those seasons here, but it's all kind of blended into one. <laughs> we are so blessed. You know, no snow. Rare, rarely do we get snow. When I came here in 1972, I think it was either 72 or 73, a little bit of snow fell on the ground. I laughed. People were going to snow stores to buy snow tires and all this. <laughs> you haven't even seen snow. <laughs> There's a time and a season for every purpose under heaven. He goes on to say there's a time to be born. There's a time to die. He says there's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. He says there's a time for peace and then there's a time for war. So there's a time for everything under the sun. And God says in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11, He will make everything beautiful in His time. It's not in our time. It's in His time. In His time, everything will be made beautiful in God's perfect timing. In Ephesians chapter 2, right after the book of, uh, let's see, Galatians and then Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 4, the Bible says, but God who is rich in his mercy. And let's not forget what we're talking about here. Sacrifice. Amen? We're talking about what did Jesus have to lay down to lay down in the manger. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ for by grace are you saved. He raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith that is not of yourselves. It's a gift from God not of works, lest anyone should boast. So the Bible says back here in verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. What does that look like? In Revelation chapter 21, after the great white throne judgment of the unsaved dead, 
In Revelation 21, God writes this through the Apostle John. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Remember we talked, I think it was a week or two ago, about how everyone likes something new. Think about a brand new heaven and a brand new earth wherein dwells righteousness. No more corruption. Now the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there's no more sea. And I kind of get a chuckle out of people who want to save the earth and kill the people. <laughs> it's like, do you not know that this planet is going to burn? God is going to fry this thing to the ground. Second Peter chapter 3 says, He will heat it up with a great fire and it will melt and all the works in it. Yes, we are to respect the place that we live. We don't throw trash around, trash out the forest. But we don't worship the earth. We worship the Lord. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is now with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. It will be no longer an act of faith that I believe God is real and I'm praying to him. I can actually speak to him face to face. The Bible says now we see darkly, but then we'll see face to face. We'll know even as we are known because we'll have the mind of Christ. So we'll literally be able to talk to the Lord face to face. That is an amazing thing. And then he goes on to say, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. Hallelujah. There will be no more sorrow. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Have you ever noticed as you get older that you start buying things to lessen the pain? Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> I mean, it may not be pills. It may be little machines like one I just got that vibrates on your knees. But have you ever noticed that? You know, when you're young, you just run around. You don't care about anything. You're healthy and everything. As you get older, it's like, Where'd that come from? Yeah. <laughs> Things start growing on you. <laughs> Gravity takes over. Things start to sag. I'm just, I'm just saying, have, have, you, have you ever noticed? <laughs> but God says, there'll be no more pain because the former things will pass away. In verse 5, he says, he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I'll make all things new. Right, for these things are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who is thirsty. He who overcomes will inherit all things. Now think about that. Most of us come from families with two or three people. I know one family that has 11 people in it. Okay, so when mom and dad go, they're going to have to split it nine ways. But in my family, there were five, and it was to be split five ways, and somehow it got split four. <laughs> I'm trying to point that out to you because we're going to inherit all things. All of it. It's like my friend one time, uh, we went into the store and there was a certain item that they had been missing for a long time and he walked in and, and the lady said, oh, we just got in a shipment and how many would you like? And he said, all of them. <laughs> he, he bought them all. He wrote out a check for like 400 bucks. I said, what are you going to do with all those? It's going to take you 10 years to use any of that. It'll probably go spoiled before you use it. He said, because I could. I bought it all. And God says you're going to get it all, all of it. All the new planets that God makes, 
all the new things that are in the brand new heaven and earth, everything will belong to us individually. All of it. Let me read that scripture again. He who overcomes will inherit all things. I will be his God. He will be my son or my child. Amen. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 Now we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. He was crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So that's why we can truly agree with John chapter 11, verse 26, where Jesus said, He who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Death is only shedding our body, that kind of death. He's talking about eternal death. Eternal separation from God in a lake filled with fire and brimstone. We'll never taste the second death. We will never die according to God's word. Yes, we'll shed our body. Who wouldn't want to? I mean, gravity's just wreaking havoc on most of us. So praise God we get a brand new body with brand new eyesight. Brand new legs, brand new arms, brand new superior, everything about us. There'll be no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow. That should make us do the happy dance right there. 1 John chapter 4. Look at all that Jesus gave up so we could have this. He gave up his royal crown his scepter, his robe, his place with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He gave that all up. I mean, how many of us, seriously, if we won the lottery and got in the flesh and bought a $30 million mansion, like some of those famous preachers on TV, let's say we lived to that awesome mansion, and somebody says, I want to invite you to come and live with me in northern India, where Christians are being pummeled to death, and killed by the dozens every day. I want you to leave your mansion, and I want you to come and move into a cardboard hut with me in northern India. How many of us would really do that? Honestly, how many of us would really consider, let's leave, you know, we won $50 million in the lottery. You got to play it first to win it, by the way. But let's just say you won it, and you bought this mansion, and somebody said, I want you to come to northern India and live in a hut with me so we can minister to these people. How many really would do that? And yet Jesus Christ left the most glorious mansion we could ever imagine. He left his high place in the kingdom of heaven. He laid down everything. And, not, and just didn't come here like in our form. He came here like a baby. A helpless baby that was dependent on a 16-year-old girl called Mary. Think about the sacrifice that he did for us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 says, In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And he's talking about live eternally through him. This is, in this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means full and complete payment. There's nothing else owed. He died for us so that we owe nothing to the Father except love. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it doesn't know him. That's why the world reacts crazily towards those who believe. That's why the world reacts 
for good morals and saving babies' lives and unborn babies' lives and all of those things. That's why the world reacts in such a different way because they don't know him. So in closing today, let me paint you a picture of what Jesus really had to lay down in order to lay in the manger. In Psalm 103, Psalm 103, That will be our closing scripture today. We could talk for months about the goodness of God and about all that he's done for us. But I think these verses right here just describe it. Verses 1 through 14 in Psalm 103. David writes, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Do not forget all of his benefits. Man, it grieves me when I hear people say, well, look what I did in my life. I did this all by myself. And I challenge him and say, you know, praise God that you made up your mind to use what God had given you. But first of all, you have to name what God didn't give you, and that could be yours. So think about it. God gave us light to see, eyes to see with. He gave us fingers and hands and arms to work with. He gave us breath to breathe so that we could live. He gave us a brain to think. Well, most of us, he gave a brain to think. You know, <laughs> there's some in the world, I really wonder. Uh, and, he, and, and he gave us a heart that pumps blood. And he made the blood. He keeps our heart beating at night. He keeps our lungs breathing at night. Forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all of your iniquities? I've met believers that have said, yeah, I know, but there's this one thing that I did that I don't think God's ever forgiven. God forgives everything. He forgives it all. You know who doesn't forgive it? We don't forgive it. God forgives it all. God forgives it all. He heals all your diseases. I've had a question in my mind. Hmm. That's interesting. My dad died of cancer. And the Lord answered, I healed his disease. I gave him a heavenly healing. I brought him home where there's no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more struggles, no more death. That's a full healing. That's called a heavenly healing. So sometimes God gives us a heavenly healing of our diseases. And sometimes, miraculously, he heals our diseases here. Miraculously. Whether he uses doctors or not, it doesn't matter. Because God gave the doctors the brain, the fingers, the hands, the eyes, and all the wisdom to know how to do what he showed them to do in the first place. Where do you think they got their wisdom from? The Bible says in James chapter 1, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask from God. And God will give it to him liberally. So any kind of wisdom that we have, we got it from the Lord. We didn't... We didn't come by it ourselves. We got it from the Lord. He heals all your diseases and he redeemed your life from destruction. You might say, well, I've been a good kid all my life. I don't think I've ever done really anything wrong. I obey my parents. I went to church with them. I did everything right. Yeah, and the enemy was waiting around the corner to trip you up and take you out. Like those three little boys that attended that church, teenagers, back in, I think it was Louisiana, uh, one of the southern states, they walked into the church and they sat way in the back and the preacher was preaching and they just mocked him the whole time, laughing and joking and throwing things at each other. Finally, one of the deacons went back and tried to get him to be quiet and they told him where to go. And, and about halfway through the sermon, they got up and walked out of the church. A little bit later, as the pastor was preaching, he heard all these sirens. You know what? The devil was waiting for those three. They jumped in their car and sped up over the hill, and as they crossed the railroad tracks and came down on the other side, they hit a semi head on, and all three of them were killed instantly. He redeems your life from destruction. Man, when I was a little kid in Utah, we lived uh, just at the base of a huge mountain. And that mountain was at least a thousand feet or maybe more. It was an incredibly tall mountain. 
and some of my family has seen it as we've gone back to Utah. We crawled up that mountain as little kids. That was back in the 1950s when there was no, uh, no parental uh, child abuse or anything like that. You could just pretty much shoot each other with BB guns and do all that kind of stuff. One day, me and my, my friend, Jeff Chiquetto, walked up that mountain. And I had my brand new Daisy BB rifle in my hand. We, we crossed what's called shale rock. Have you ever walked on that? Shale rock, when it's at an angle like this? You think you're walking straight across? Actually, what you're doing is you're going downhill. And right at the end of that shale rock was a cliff, 500 feet. And so we're walking across, we didn't realize because we're young and foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. So we're walking across it and all of a sudden we look and the cliff is right there and we're about four feet from it. And we've still got from here to there to go. And we know every step we take, we slip down a little bit. And so finally, Jeff just basically ran across and grabbed this bush and pulled himself to safety. And I had to make a decision. My life or my brand new Daisy BB rifle. <laughs> Off the rifle went. And I just kind of crawled over. I mean, I was literally inches from the edge when Jeff held a branch out and I grabbed it and he pulled me to safety. Who redeems your life from destruction? You ever been driving on the road and the Lord just put it in your heart to go slower? And as you started to go slower, the car just went right past in front of you? He redeems your life from destruction. I don't know how many diseases the Lord has saved me from. I don't know how many railroad train accidents the Lord has delivered me from. We had a railroad tr uh, track run right in front of our house, about 50 yards out, right in front of our house. We had to cross it every day to go to school. Sometimes the train would stop and we'd crawl up over it. But he, re he redeemed my life from destruction. He redeemed your life from destruction as well. All of our lives from destruction. He has crowned us with loving kindness. Good thing, if he paid us back for what we've done, we wouldn't be here. He crowns our life with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfies our mouth with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. Because the Lord is merciful and gracious, he is slow to anger and abounding in mercy. Thank God. The way some of us have lived, if it wasn't for mercy and grace, we wouldn't be here. The Bible says he will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Because God is patient and he's loving and he's kind towards his children. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Nor has God punished us according to our iniquities. Because as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far God has removed our transgressions from us. So I've lived in uh, Santa Maria for 50, 52, going on 53 years now I've lived here. I know a lot of people. Uh, it's amazing how many people I run into that remind me of my past. I like the fact that my past is as far <laughs> from the east as it is to the west. Nancy is uh, my visitation partner. She's also my mom in the Lord. But we went to the hospital one day, Nancy and I, and I had on my little pastor's badge that they give you so you can go visiting in the hospital and we went up to the fourth floor no, no laughing yet okay we went, <laughs> we went up to the fourth floor and there's always a person sitting there that wants to know who are you visiting and I'll go ahead and open the door for you well I have that little badge that I can just go like that and it opens the door automatically but we went up there and told her who we we're going to visit and she looked at me and she said I know you and I'm looking at her, and she's probably in her mid-60s. So she knew me when I was young and stupid. So I'm looking at her. I don't recognize her. It's been 50 years. 
So she said, I know you. And I said, how do I know you? And she said, do you remember a bar called The Playroom? <laughs> now it's O'Sullivan's. <laughs> and I said, The Playroom. And boy, my mind's going 100 miles an hour. The Playroom. What did I do there? What did I do there? And then it all came to me. Uh, there were 17 of us on, this is the unsaved days, okay? This is the days we were not Christians. There were 17 of us on motorcycles that pulled up to the playroom, and we just went in to play pool and goof around, and there were these cowboys in there, and they started to fight with us. Well, unfortunately, the whole bar got torn up, phone got ripped off the wall, popcorn machine got broke, and all the pool balls on the tables were thrown at people, uh, etc. <laughs> so we pretty well trashed the bar. She was the barmaid. <laughs> and she's looking at me and she said I know you and I'm, I'm thinking about all this in my mind and so when she said the playroom it was like oh no and then she said and you're a pastor <laughs> and I said yeah God our God is so good he redeems our life from destruction Nancy's standing there going I don't know him <laughs> your past will catch up with you but just remember it's as far as the east is from the west in God's eyes people will remember people aren't your judge the one who is your judge is the one who has nail holes right here Amen. and a nail holds through his feet he redeems your life from destruction he has passed your transgressions as far as the east is from the West. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father who pities his children, the Lord pities those who fear him. Amen? He knows our frame. He remembers that we're made of dust. We are so wavering that God could just go and would be gone. But thank God he holds us in the palm of his hand. He redeems our life from destruction. Amen? Amen? Praise God he laid down so much for us. We're going to learn more about what he laid down next week. But would you stand with me? We're going to go ahead and close this morning. So seeing Jesus born in a manger, we see now just how much he lowered himself so that we could be free. Father, thank you so much for your love for us, Lord. We give you praise and we give you glory, Father. You tell us in your word not to cast away our confidence that has great reward. You tell us we have need of endurance so that after we have done your will, we could receive the promise. And so I thank you, Lord, that your promises are always yes and amen in Christ Jesus the Lord. I thank you for your love for us, for your mercy for us, for all that you gave up, leaving your heavenly home to come and save us from ourselves. So I ask today, Lord, that you burn this message deeply into our spirits. And Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I am going to be standing up here, Lord, and I, I just pray that you'll put it on their heart to come and take my hand so that I can show them in the scripture how they can too receive your mercy, your grace, and your salvation. And Lord, anyone who needs prayer here, we have so many wonderful prayer warriors that they're welcome to come forward after we're dismissed and we will be happy to pray with them. So Father, with that, dismiss us with your blessing today. Thank you for your goodness and your grace in our lives. Thank you for your mercy. And Lord, I thank you most of all that I know you're in control. There is nothing that passes to us that doesn't come through your hand first. So I thank you and praise you for your goodness today. Bless now this company of believers. Bless us, Lord, as we dismiss in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. You're dismissed. Amen.
for our peace was laid on 